Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, Fade to Black. How you doing? Today's Thursday, June 8th, 2023. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight's, oh, what a crazy week. What a crazy week. Tonight, John Greenwald Jr. of the Black Vault joins us. We're going to be talking about a lot of things tonight, and we're going to center stuff around, uh, I'm just calling him the UAP whistleblower, David Grush. Uh, We'll be talking about that tonight and uh, trying to approach things from every angle. And before I go into uh, one of my favorite things uh, to do in the past was to read John Greenwald's 15-page CV about how amazing of a life he has led. And ever since he was six years old, before the internet, he started the Black Vault and did all of that on his own and uh, created the internet and now owns the internet, the blackvault.com. The links for it are below. If you really want the best reading, period, the reason for the internet, go to the Black Vault. And the, the, the crazy thing, from what I understand, it's all free. Welcome back, John Greenwald. How you doing, Sir Junior? I'm good. I'm good. I think we may have to fact check a couple things in that intro for next time, but don't worry about it. We'll go with it. Let's 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 rock and roll. All right. You were six and a half years old. It's, Thank it's, you. Now, I, it's, it's, now it's accurate. I know. I know. I know. I know. Well, you know, you, um, you and I talk about this a lot, but it's really um, a funny story. So I'll tell the abbreviated version. Back in the day, like before Mosaic, right? Back in the day, I stumbled upon uh, the Black Vault. And and I know, I know from uh, when and where that happened, you must have been weeks into the website, right? Okay, so anyway, I find it's the name that grabbed me and I'm looking for everything UFO, you know, and, and I thought to myself, I I was so innocent. The police are going to kick down my front door. This is a website that is not supposed to be out there. This right here is not legal. And I've been addicted to uh, the black vault ever since. Of course, you know, we have become friends and, and, and all of that, but that, that was now let's think about this for a second. It started in 96. I I was going to say almost, almost 30 years ago. That's nuts, man. That's nuts. I, yeah, it, it, uh, even in the beginning days, didn't even have the black vault name, but it, it came shortly after, but I had one of those crazy, you know, total 1990s website with flashy graphics and stuff. And UFOs was just a, a subsection of a website that, you know, one person a year would look at. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there, you know, that one little section, but yeah, 96 is when I, when I started it and. I can just in documents in by hand, man. I don't right, miss those right, days at right, all. <laughs> right, 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 right. I can just picture your mom. John, dinner's ready. Are you going to come out of your room in a minute, mom? Yeah, yeah. Got a some kind of uh, 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 what? What? What's the word? Ancient scanner, you know? Something. <laughs> well, you know. that's the thing. I didn't even have a scanner back in the day. I would literally type it in by hand, uh, and. <laughs> That, I think I got to, I forget what it was. It was under a thousand pages, but I mean hundreds of pages that that typed in by hand, and I would figure out like a, a an a, what they call ASCII code. Not not to age myself because nobody really knows what ASCII code is anymore. But I would figure out the symbols to denote blacked out document, you know, blacked out parts of the document, 
and uh, other symbols for letters you couldn't read, you know, in a 1940s document. It was crazy back then, man. It was a it was a whole different Wild West on the Internet. I cannot believe you just drop ASCII on yeah. this on this show. I should watch That's, my language. I yeah, that was that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, so uh, here's uh, we have so much to cover tonight, and um, and I'm going to start here as 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 nutty as uh, David Grush is the story, um, uh, not David. Um, the, the story, and as crazy as it is. It's not as crazy as 10-foot aliens crash landing in Las Vegas asking where Mick West's house is. That's pretty nuts. And, and so when that news <laughs> when that news broke, um, what is 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 the timing of uh, are are we to expect UFO alien contact centric news from here on out. Is this the world we we live in now? You know, I, I don't want to take away from the Vegas case because I'll preface it with saying I have not had time to look at it. So I'm not going to sit here and either say, yes, this is um, uh, yet another explosive story, nor will I say, oh, my gosh, we need to dismiss it. Uh, so so that aside. What I can speak to more broadly, and, and you can look back at, at the history of this, when a major UFO story breaks, like the major ones, and they go viral and they go all around the world, generally within the, the next couple of days as that story starts to die off from the news cycle, obviously this is a huge one, but it starts to die off. You see other ones, right? They try and ride that wave a little bit. And it really is a fascinating thing to watch the media and how it operates. And it's not just with UFOs, but other hot topic stories as well, where they try and ride that wave. Now, I'm not saying that that's what they're doing in this particular story. So before everybody sends me hate mail, I just I haven't looked into this case yet. But I think I joked about it with my wife uh, just yesterday or the day before. And because she was talking uh, uh, about the, the Grush story and she heard about it from friends at work that are really into the topic. What does your husband think? And, you know, that kind of stuff. And in the course of that conversation, I, I joked around. I said, you watch, you know, as the attention from that just starts to wane a little bit until something else new comes around, you'll start to see another UFO story or two. And that's exactly what happened with the Las Vegas, you know, story here that we got um, uh put before us here in the last uh, day or two. So it, it never fails. And again, that's uh, I'm sure we'll get into it in the in the show. But um, I joke around about it in the context that you and I are chatting about it now. But it is actually really serious when you talk about how there is a lack of investigation in investigative journalism this day and age when it comes to UAP and UFOs. And uh, and, and that's the unfortunate thing. So when we see stories that are generally coming out around the wave of a viral story like this, and I know that the case didn't happen this week, it just was reported this week. You know, why wasn't this reported on a week or two ago? You know, what, what, it, what is with that? And then you start to kind of dissect a little bit about how the media operates. Again, that's not to take away from the case or the magnitude of the story, but rather that's an element of this conversation that becomes a very, very important aspect to tackle as well. Well, we have, you know, oddly enough, I, I can take this right back to Las Vegas, too, as well. And that story, that happened on May 1st. Uh, the last time I checked, this is June 8th. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and it's just, wouldn't that be... Uh, George Knapp lives in Las Vegas, right? KLAS is in Las Vegas. The, the home of UFO reporting... Why? Why do you think the delay in that, and, and, and as well as uh, David Grush? David Grush, um, he's been out there. We're, we're going to try to put together a timeline today, and hopefully, you can help me um, understand in the audience too as well. The Grush story. Uh, we're talking about Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal again. Um, why, why wait to put this story out? It doesn't matter about the New York Times or anything else. Um, it just seems like uh, it, it, it was delayed for, for quite a bit. Now, um, let me just say one thing really quick uh, for the audience. In, in case there's somebody out there that doesn't know, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal 
um, and, 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 and some others in the byline, by the way. It wasn't just those two uh, doing the reporting. But they, back in December, December 16th, 17th of uh, 2017, broke the story that uh, the UFO, uh, the Pentagon had a secret UFO program. Um, that was five and a half, almost six years ago now. It's kind of hard to believe that that much time has passed. <laughs> but here we are, Monday of this week, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal again release this story. And it was about what, John? Well, this week is the, the UFO whistleblower story and the, the, the emergence of, of David Grush and a explosive claim about non-human craft that the the government is either in possession of as a whole uh, and in part, you know, that, that there was uh, essentially debris and, and material that they have. And he subsequently, it wasn't in the original article, uh, but this week, News Nation, which is, uh, you know, not a major, major network, but obviously getting a lot of press this week mm -hmm. for having Ross Coltart do a video interview from what I understand is going to be an hour special that airs this Sunday uh, with the UFO whistleblower. Um, now, I, 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 I don't know how much, if any, coordination there was between Leslie, Ralph and, and Ross. That may have been in one of their articles slash videos that I may have missed. I'm. A little less interested in that. I mean, it's a, to me, it's about the story and not really about if they, you know, were working together to, 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 to put this out. But the bottom line is the debrief published the story from Ralph and Leslie. They were the two on the byline, and then they had contributors that were listed at the bottom of the article. Um, again, I don't know exactly the, the amount of contributions that each name did, but it was just Ralph and Leslie on the byline. And then you have Ross's contribution of the video interview, uh, that essentially is going to be airing on News Nation. All of that kind of unfolded in the beginning of the week, and then as the week progressed, News Nation has been obviously plugging their Sunday special a lot and running subsequent news stories that, uh, in in fairness to them, have a balance. You know, like some are, are very pro this UFO whistleblower, it seems, and should they tease clips of what we're going to see on Sunday. And then I saw yesterday that Mick West was on the network, uh, which I, I very much respect Mick and, and like him and consider him a friend. I, we have great conversations and great debate also. We don't see eye to eye on everything. Uh, but with that being said, it was very weird that a network, while they are plugging an interview for Sunday, are all, are, are, is teasing it. That's not weird. That's normal. But then doing segments to essentially debunk the whole concept before it even airs in full anyway. Which is weird to me. And I posted it yesterday, and I think a lot of people didn't quite get. And it's probably my fault. I didn't explain it good enough. But to me, it's just bizarre. Like, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it hasn't aired in full. So we can critique, um, you know, the, the, the story, I think, either during the special or after if I was the network. Um, but regardless, you know, I, I, I thought that that was kind of a weird tactic, that they're kind of attacking their own reporting before the reporting is even complete. So it, it, it was just a weird kind of way to unfold. But regardless, I think it kind of fell flat with a lot of people yesterday. And again, that may have just been uh, me just not explaining it good. But it's been a weird week to see those things unfold. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the debrief had published the article. But when News Nation did their first story on it, they played a clip that Grush had, had talked about what he called dead pilots. And those dead pilots or bodies from these non-human craft, um, <clears throat> that's a pretty explosive claim to make. And so that, in a nutshell, is what we are seeing this week. But once you dig into it, all of a sudden, as with most stories when it comes to this genre, uh, they start to pose more questions than answers. And, and I think with this particular story, there's quite a few big ones that I think we need to address here because here's the bottom line as you and I move forward with this show and, and dissect some of that. The bottom line is if his claims are true, they change humanity, period. I'm not exaggerating that. That is true. It replaces the entire human thought concept of where we are in the universe, that alien life, uh, that that. Non, as they term it, I want to be fair here, non-human 
But let's face it. I mean, I think that they're meaning alien with all of this. And David Grush even says we are not alone in his in his interview. But I think they're paving the way for some other intelligence, which I think is I called it on my show wonky yesterday. It's just kind of like like say alien. You know, I mean, if you if you want to say that there is another race of intelligence that live in our oceans, then go there. I'm not trying to be facetious that much. But I mean, if that's really what you mean, that there's some other meaning of non-human, then go there. You're the one with all the classified intelligence. So, you know, say what you mean. So I, I'm, I'm equating to all this is that they're saying that it's, it's alien and especially with his quote of we are not alone, um, that, that that's exactly what he means. But again, it's, it's just a little bit odd, the, the, the word choice. But going back to my, my caveat here before we unfold all the different facets of this story is that it changes humanity. So we need to kind of take a step back before we get excited and start to dissect this story for what it is. And if it's true and the claims are solid, then we've changed the planet uh, and, and, and the story will stay true. But I, I think we're not at that point yet. And I think the mainstream media, for the most part, has missed that. And the copy and paste journalism is to blame. We have to we have to ask questions with all of this. You can't take any of this at face value. You, you, you cannot just go. It, it's it must be true. Um, and that's it. So and I totally I totally get that. I come from more of a everything is a everything is bs and then you know i get pushed to the other side i try to stay on that side um or in the middle and remain objective in this case there is uh the, in in the david grush case um there are things that kind of automatically push me further than i'm comfortable with uh to the this may not be bs side and and that for me, first off, a government employee, a decorated veteran, a member of the UAP task force, um, access to um, and you know he's got a security clearance. Um, he's a single individual that um, is, has now put himself out there, opening himself up to a very harsh life if he's bullshitting, right? I mean, that's a, so, and then on top of all of that, we have the IG and he's lawyered up. And apparently, again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not part of the inside, but he has sworn to these statements. And, uh, and we've got Congress and Capitol Hill involved. These are the things for me that push this a little bit farther than even I'm comfortable with, where I go, well, wait a minute here. Why would this guy do this to himself? Have you asked yourself those same questions? All the time when stories like this come out and, and Grush is no exception. Uh, you know, why would you do it? And, and one of the things that I think that is a big misconception, and, and I see this a lot, I call them my haters, you know, it's, it's the fan club that loves me, but they don't realize it yet. And they're always on social media and they're always attacking me when I breathe the wrong way or sneeze or whatever I do, they're right there to say Greenwald's wrong. And in this particular case, the moment that you question somebody with credentials or with decorations, the misconception is you immediately are calling them a liar, that you're immediately disrespecting that person. And, and this is my response to that. That is not necessarily true, because when, when you dig into the claims of David Grush and you see what he's bringing forward, he is bringing forward his experience talking to other people, which are the ones that were involved in these programs that bring along with it, according to him, classified knowledge about these non-human craft and alien bodies and so on. So he's getting it from other people. He wasn't there. We'll pull in the story of Bob Lazar as a, a kind of a juxtaposition here where Bob Lazar claimed he was actually there that he worked on the programs, that he was reverse engineering the craft, right? That to me is a whistleblower. I don't 
by Lazar's story, but that's a different show in itself. But using that as a comparison, that's more of the whistleblower, that they are claiming that firsthand experience that they touched, felt, worked on, uh, and understood the alien technology. That's not what we have with David Grush. Now, that's not to take away from what he's doing or saying, nor is it disrespect, but that's putting what his claims are into perspective. Now, going back to the misconception of you're brandishing him a liar if you question him, well, what if he is misled? What if, what if those people are playing him? I get it from what we're told anyway. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more proof. But what we're told is they are going to Congress, too, and some have given under oath statements. Great. I hope that we meet them one day, and I hope we can see who they are. Because those are the people that I think need to be out there stating what their claims really are. To have a conduit like David Grush... That's putting him in a seriously awkward position because he may be convinced that the stories are true. He can swear under oath with no repercussion because he is conveying what was told to him. But how do we know that he's not being played? Now, those that want to believe this story outright and, and say, look, you know, decorated intelligence officer, how could people play him? Well, I'm sorry, you look at the, the documented history with evidence of a cover-up that stretches back decades and decades. That's not conspiracy talk. You look at the evidence. I've got thousands of pages that I'll bore anybody with for hours upon hours showing they have a massive cover-up on this, and they will do things to not only obfuscate the truth, but lie to the general public in the process. They've done it before on this topic, and they will do it again. They skewed a scientific effort in 1952 with the Robertson panel, skewing a scientific effort known as Project Blue Book to look into UFOs because they wanted to explain it. They knew what the threat was. They were afraid of us, of the, the general public. And so that Robertson panel, in a nutshell, essentially said, hey, you guys got to start doing explaining here. Let's, let's kind of like wave goodbye to investigation, but let's do an explanation. And you see that through the eyes of the, the true scientist on board, J. J. Allen Hynek, who shifted over time as he saw more and more evidence. So when you look at those stories, you realize the government will, will go to great lengths to cover this up. There are people that muddy the waters from the inside. We know that. So how do we know that that hasn't been done and, and David Grush is being played? And, but, and I think until we don't... Sorry, but go ahead. Played, but played by who? Well, uh, that's a great question, Jimmy. Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> played by who and, and why? Because um, that means Leslie and Ralph are being played. And but, we but, have, uh, but, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you know, I know that we're talking about David here, but Leslie has also cited this Colonel Nell. Uh, we've got what I think is a pseudonym of uh, Jonathan Gray. Gray yeah. um, and so, uh, and Leslie has gone on the record saying, look, um, I don't necessarily need photographs or videos. I'm being told the exact same story from multiple sources of people that I know and trust. So is that the other part of this article um, by by Kane and Blumenthal that also needs to, does that hold equal weight, you know, to have this Jonathan Gray with his quote and Colonel Nell uh, with his quote in this article? And, think, and Chris Mellon, of course, too, is, is mentioned in there as well. Yeah, and one thing, and I didn't mean to step on you, but one thing I wanted to make sure I made clear is that when we talk about Kane and Blumenthal being played, it, it, it may just not be a malicious being played because Grush believes what he is being told. Um, but again, if, if and, and, and I'm not trying to sound conspiratorial here, but there's a documented history of obfuscation and lies. And I also believe that we are in an era where the counterintelligence value of the UAP conversation is huge. I believe that that counterintelligence value uh, is used to cover up true unknowns. I believe that there is a small percentage of true unknowns here that we have no idea what it is. It covers up what we do and don't know about our, our you know enemies abroad and what they may have. And it is used to cover up our own 
classified technology. So that counterintelligence value is gold. So yes, we shouldn't, with this history of obfuscation and lies stretching back more than a half a century, we should not put it past a, a, a we'll call it a campaign, that's the wrong word, but an effort to get these types of stories out there to muddy the waters even more, right? I mean, again, it sounds like conspiracy talk, but I'm sorry, the same people that are chastising me for, uh, for bringing that possibility up, and I mean this, the same people are also saying that I am being played by a massive conspiracy that involves the creation of government documents to throw me off through the Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. and the use of DOD spokespeople and using the blackvault.com as the conduit for a misinformation campaign. Now, I laugh at that because it's not true, but if the same crowd is chastising me for saying, hey, maybe Grush is being played, but in the same breath, they'll say Greenwald's the conduit working with the U.S. government in a massive conspiracy to misinform and disinform all of us on the UAP topic. Mm -hmm. None of that really makes sense. So if you if you want to deal with one of those possibilities, you got to deal with it all. Now, the second part of your question about the other quotations, of course, Colonel Nell, uh, Colonel, I believe, uh, Nell yeah. coming coming forward. Absolutely. All of that plays a role. I mean, his his character support you know about uh, 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 uh about grush's character and and who he is as a person that he's not like some malicious liar or anything like that all of that is is great not so much of of a fan of the jonathan gray part i had missed it on my first read through of the article that's a pseudonym um it wasn't really clear until later in the article that that's his insider nickname that he uses at nasic uh, which, you know, is is great. But he, now he's identified himself to anybody that has a clearance. So I'm not entirely sure how to think about that. But if that is his internal nickname uh, that he's, or pseudonym that he's using there, um, he's kind of outed himself to anybody that's looking at this. So I'm not sure what his concern is for having the public know who he is. But regardless, uh, that's that's the third essential voice, essentially voice that's that's in that article. Yes, Chris Mellon is uh, is in there. Uh, as well. But I, I kind of focused in on those three new names um, because just to throw a quick positive note out there, it, it was pretty cool to see how, you know, Grush's involvement with the National Reconnaissance Office during the UAP task force and then obviously Colonel Nell through the Army and his uh, leading kind of being the liaison between the Army and the UAP task force. To me, those are awesome contributions to this conversation by itself because that gives me lines to draw from in future FOIA requests, names that I didn't know last Sunday, uh, but come Monday, all of a sudden those were revealed. So, so those are great tidbits from this article, whether or not Grush's claims are true or not. So to end that thought on your question, yeah, there, it's incredibly important to see those names and additional pieces of the puzzle because for someone like me who digs in on every little character of every little word, uh, it's going to pave the way for quite a few new FOIA requests and spoiler alert, it already has. Have you um, in your timeline, um, I'm very interested in this part because I'm, I'm a little confused about this. Yeah. Um, Ross's interview with Grush, when did that take place? Sadly, I'm not going to be able to answer that for you, at least off the top of my head. I am not sure if Ross has posted that. Okay. I, it, it's my, now again, sue me, whatever, if I've got this wrong. I think it took place months ago. And I, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. So, d did Ross's interview uh, uh, influence the article, or did the article come out, and then did Ross somehow magically sit down with David Grush like this week? Yeah, um, um, I, that that um, has a lot to do with the timing of all of this. And I'm very curious. I, I respect uh, Ross so much, ex but, uh, um, and I love his style. And from what I have seen so far of this interview, he doesn't play. Are you lying to me? I love that question. That's what <laughs> that was, man. Um, it is, 
uh, uh, the the information that was in the article didn't seem like uh, Ross had access to that. Um, so I don't I don't know. Uh, it, uh, yeah, and and this is where it gets a little bit uh, weird. So I, I no, I don't know the date. And and again, maybe your listeners right now watching they they know I I try to keep up on every single facet. But as you know, things go so fast in UFO land from tweets and articles and videos and podcasts. And there's just not enough hours in the day. I mean, I've got a 100% unrelated job uh, that that takes a lot of hours of my week on top of, you know, just trying to run the, the, the Black Vault for fun and keep everybody informed. So it, it's hard to keep up. So that said, I, the, that date may be out there. But what's interesting to me is what I do know is, went out there was a coordinated statement. It was essentially a copy and pasted message that was posted by Leslie Kane on Facebook and Ralph Blumenthal on Twitter, uh, essentially stating that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, I'll pull it up if you want me to read it, but paraphrasing stating that uh, the Washington Post did not turn down their article. So they wanted it known about the Washington Post more than all others. I I'm guessing just because it had kind of become such a rumor that that Washington Post was going to be doing a big UFO story, potentially dealing with crash retrievals. So that's probably why they spoke directly to that. They said that they didn't turn the story down, but rather was taking too long and that they were getting pressured to put this thing out and then got in contact with the de debrief and then they, they published it there. Yeah, that okay. was well. Okay, this is where I step on you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I apologize. No, um, uh, I know everybody at the debrief, as as do you, mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with a few of them directly over the years. And it's a streamlined organization. So if, if you've got something that uh, the the editorial process uh, to get something published. Um, can happen fairly quickly at the debrief, whereas, uh, you know, Washington Post or the New York Times, and you're dealing with news directors and a, and, a, and a lawyer team and everything else that you have to to go through, I understand that process. I don't think that the New York Times, I could be wrong, and the Washington Post passed on this because that, that they thought that the story was bogus. I, I, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not suggest that's not what you're saying, but what I am no. suggesting here is that the choice of the debrief for me makes a lot of sense. You could just go in there. Here it is. Boom. They're very smart people. Micah and Tim and the team go through this and, and, and vet and do what they have to do uh, to get the story published. What I'm more surprised about is, is how long it's taken for the rest of the media to pick up on this story um, in a positive or negative light. It, it seems now it's, it's, it's catching on, but this should have been headline news, like you said, the biggest news in, in the history of mankind. This should have been all over the place by Monday night. I mean, in fairness, I think it was, uh, you know, maybe not by Monday night, but come Tuesday, especially when it went on Drudge Report, and and compliments for debrief. That's a, the, I, I watched. I talk about the Drudge Report a lot. I know that uh, depending upon your political views, uh, you may or may not like that website. But for me, it's it's not about the politics. It that is a coveted spot to be in in media. And since UFOs are largely uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan, largely sometimes, uh, generally you will see those stories pop up on Drudge Report and. It, and for me, I watch those types of news stories. It gives me FOIA ideas well away from the UFO stuff. It gives me FOIA ideas for other uh, types of, of stories that are breaking, stuff like that. But when it comes to UFOs, that's that's an awesome spot to be in because it doesn't run UFO stories all the time. And Debrief got their column one, uh, or excuse me, column three, uh, position one. So once that happened, it was all over the place. So maybe not Monday night, but Tuesday it really started going hog wild. And then as the, the week progressed, you saw quite a bit more there, I think, is going to be a interesting story unfold on why Washington Post was taking so long. And Vanity Fair published an article earlier this morning, which essentially focused less on Grush's claims, more on why didn't the New York Times cover this? Um, they are said to have said no and passed on it. 
uh, that was in the Vanity Fair, while but did not submit an official comment to to Vanity Fair about that. So it was said that New York Times passed it up. Washington Post was in the process of vetting it. So I think that this is an interesting aspect to the story because um, based on what you just said and you think debrief is a, a prime spot for it, I know those guys as well. This is not supposed to be offensive whatsoever. I'm sure it'll come off as that. Um, but I think a story of this magnitude uh, should have been in a, uh, we'll call it big, you know, bigger masthead. And, and I, want to, I want to be really clear here that that's not meant to be disrespectful. If Grush came to me, I would say the same thing. I have seen stories over the years that, yes, people have come to me, not actually UFO related, um, but that's not what my site is about. You know, when you talk about whistleblower claims that can change humanity, um, I think that that should be something with a masthead that has a well-established uh, vetting process. Uh, I won't say exactly who, but I think a major organization uh, was probably a better fit for such a magnitude. Yeah, but, and, I'll say, but, and I just but, want to say one last thing, though. That okay. is not meant to be disrespectful. Uh, I no, really it, like those guys, and it's that, not, that's not what I mean. Those guys are too cool, and they know exactly their position in all of this, and they know Christmas came early, all right? So they, mm. <laughs> they're very thankful for that. But <laughs> but you, you said something. Uh, that Leslie mentioned, or, or maybe it was Ralph, doesn't matter. The word pressure. Yeah. Who, 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 who pressures Leslie Kane? I, I want to know who that person is because that person has NAD. Who, who pressures Ralph Blumenthal? I, I don't. Why use that word? And 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 who do you think was applying that pressure? I know you thought about this a lot. I right? did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and when I broadcast my video and and started it, I had kind of led off with those tweets because when I had recorded it, that was just unfolding. They had posted it. I posted it out going, well, who's pressuring them now after I recorded my video? they had dropped a video interview they did with Chrissy Newton from the debrief. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me say, I mean, she did a great job. She had great questions. Um, I, I don't say that often. I wrote her, actually, I hope she doesn't mind me saying it, but I mean, I wrote her privately and complimented her. I was like, hey, you asked some really good questions. I, I imagined just very much a kind of a, um, more of a softball interview. And again, also not meant to be disrespectful, but they were just essentially plugging their own outfits article. So I didn't expect some harder questions. And Chrissy was really good. I mean, she asked specifically about who was pressuring, asked about David Grush's kind of lack of evidence coming forward, even called it hearsay. And you can see Leslie Kane's reaction to the word being said as hearsay saying wait, wait wait a minute and she kind of corrected it when i feel chrissy was was spot on to to ask it that way but in this interview they talked to the pressure and apparently the way leslie kane described it was that things were starting to leak david grush's name was actually said by danny sheehan who i know that you're friends with uh danny sheehan had said it in an interview uh where he named a couple names and 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 said david grush and everybody was like wait what and um I really didn't think much of it uh, at the time, but I know a couple other people looked into it like, hey, who is this guy? Well, apparently based on that, uh, there were, according to Leslie Kane, phone calls. Um, and then there was other banter about an FBI raid, which doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And then uh, on top of that, they were afraid that they would essentially get scooped, which is uh, understandable. And then on top of all that, they were afraid that they would, before they even published, would have somebody attack David Grush in an attack piece and hurt his credibility before he ever really got out there. I have my doubts on that, but again, and, and that's very paraphrased, but that was from her interview. So the culmination of that apparently was the pressure that to safeguard him because they wanted to protect him they wanted to rush this out and 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 get it printed so washington post is still going through their vetting process and they essentially fast-tracked it and went to the debrief in that process my biggest question is was something sacrificed when it comes to the accuracy or vetting process 
And uh, I don't know if you want to get into this now, but I think that the bodies, the talk of the bodies uh, is a prime example to support that. How so? So in the interview with Chrissy Newton, it, it had then aired on News Nation that David Grush was talking about dead pilots and bodies. And again, compliments to her. She brought it up. She's like, wow, this is like an explosive thing to say. What, what, essentially, what did you guys think? And Leslie Kane was first to chime in. And she says, uh, we don't want to talk about that. That David Grush apparently never mentioned or talked about that with them. And uh, even if he did, they would not publish it. Now, to me, that is incredibly concerning to hear. Well, okay. Now, that's why it's important to get the timeline together when Ross did his interview versus uh, what stage of things uh, Leslie and Ralph were in uh, with their article. And not only the publishing date, which is June 5th, we understand that that was on Monday, but uh, the information gathered because clearly Grush says, you say News Nation, let's go with Ross, okay, because this was handed off to News Nation. Um, at Ross's interview, um, he says, uh, David Grush, I'm paraphrasing, he goes, well, of course, you know, if you've got craft like this, some of them you would assume have pilots, right? I mean, that's that's what he says in the interview. So did Leslie, what, what came first? Did the interview happen after Leslie and Ralph finished the story and they were not aware of this or was it the other way around? So if you're, okay, so, the, and that's, uh, again, t timeline is absolutely important. I'm huge on timelines. In fact, I wrote down a bunch of chicken scratch to make sure that I keep everything straight uh, mm -hmm. here on your show. So I, I, not sure about Ross's date uh, and also not sure like when, when Leslie and Ralph started looking into this whistleblower. But regardless of not knowing that timeline, here's my concern. If you're a whistleblower coming out with this information, the fact that you have non-human craft, as they called it, and intact craft in the possession of the government, that information is coming from, again, those confidential um, sources with classified information on their end. The bodies are going to come from there as well, essentially meaning that it all has the same weight yes. of credibility. What, how much weight that is, but still, you know, still to be seen. But it still has the same weight. So my whole point is, is that it doesn't matter if Leslie sp or Ralph specifically or directly ask, or asked Grush, hey, were there bodies? You would think that the whistleblower aiming to get his story out would give that story. Non-human craft, intact craft, debris, and, and so on in possession of the U.S. government and bodies. That is the most explosive part that. The craziest part now. Uh, okay, so and but this is this is where I'm going with this, John, and I'm very confused. He says, "Now I'm just trying to be logical. I'm just logic." He says that he provided the IG in his complaint all of the supporting evidence for this bodies and craft. That's what he says, and he and he lawyered up. Now, are, are we to assume that Leslie and Ralph and maybe even Ross haven't seen copies of this complaint? Is this complaint under seal? I, I, I would doubt that. Uh, I, well, I, it's I, unclassified, and they said that they saw it uh, because they, they had oh, confirmed. Our bodies mentioned to the IG, either IG, because apparently there's two involved. That's a here. one hundred and fifty percent awesome question that I'd love to get answered. And I reached out to Leslie and Ralph to ask directly about not only that, but a couple of, of other things. But I didn't list my questions yet. I reached out. I introduced myself. I said, I'm 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 not interested in you know, trying to make anybody look bad. I said, I just think that there's a short list of questions uh, that I would love to, to, to see if you guys would do an interview for. And Ralph was the only one that responded. And, and let me stress, he was very professional, very nice. 
uh, very cordial. There was no, no, nothing bad. Uh, said he would get back to me the next day, uh, which he did, and turned it down. Uh, they just didn't have time, which is fine. Nobody owes me anything. I'm a nobody. That's all good. So I wrote back and I said, hey, you know, I totally understand. Would you mind if I emailed some questions? And I said, I'll work very hard not to ask you anything that you've already answered, you know, in a podcast or, or the, 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 the debrief uh, interview that you did. I said, so to minimize your time, I, I said, I just think that there's some hopefully not, not um, questions that you can't answer, meaning I don't want to waste your time with stuff that, you know, is trying to reveal a source or something like that. Like, that's not where I was going with it. Um, but asked, would that be okay? And he wrote back and essentially said, no, that won't work either. So for me, that, that makes in, figuring out some of these questions very, very hard. When they say that they saw the unclassified complaint, one of my biggest questions is, why don't you drop it down on your article? And there, of course, there are going to be names in there that they should redact, right? So all the, the personally identifying information, absolutely take that out. If there are sections that you can deduce who someone is, of course, take that out. But let's see what this complaint is because you're already blasting it out all over the media. So you obviously want this out there. Why don't we put it out? But more so than that, the paperwork of what he was approved to say, which both Ralph and Leslie in their article state that on April 4th and the 6th of 2023, David Grush was authorized by Dopser to say the statements that he did to the media. That's what we were told in the debrief article. Why now I am more interested in the Dopser paperwork is I want to see what was he approved to say. Because if it says bodies, Leslie and Ralph said that they saw the paperwork. So, so in that confirmation process, you would have saw bodies. And I want to know if they did. And then the second part of that is why would you leave it out? That is an explosive claim that I'll say it again has the same exact weight as all other elements of your story. Mm-hmm. If she wants to claim that she just doesn't want to deal with bodies, which I don't know why, but just deal with craft, that's fine. But now she's saying she never heard it. So in the entire vetting process, her claim is that David Grush never talked to her about bodies. Uh, why? That to me is, is one of the biggest explosive things to say. And the fact that you are going to journalists and giving them the information. And in fact, I don't know if you want to get into this, but in August of 2022, it was said that he was already talking to people at a Star Trek convention, including talking to George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell. And that essentially, I, I mean, they claim, meaning Corbell and Knapp are going to talk about this in the next week or so. I'm looking forward to that. But obviously, Jeremy confirmed that there's a story behind this August 2022 meeting. And so that intrigues me because he was not cleared to talk about anything until April of this year. So how long was he out there shopping this around and what was he shopping around? So I'm eager to hear that part of the story. It's a kind of an unwritten puzzle piece here. No, but again, it, that Dobbs or paperwork is going to be incredibly important. Yeah, 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 it is, it is, it is. Uh, except, and this is where I go into except, and, uh, and all I'm trying to do is ask the right questions, right? It, 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 to me, it comes down to when did he file with the IG's office? Because, I can answer that one for you. Okay, when did he file with the IG's office? So from, from what I understand of the timeline, it was July of 2021 that he originally gave all this information to the Department of Defense Inspector General when it came to the claims that some of which that we are hearing about now mm -hmm. post July of 2021 was when he started what he felt was getting repercussions from that. Uh, fast forward to then the beginning of 2022, apparently he was speaking to members of Congress, right? So that was right. the beginning, beginning of 2022. He filed the complaint. I think you are now referencing in May of 2022. Stop and, right there. Stop yep. right there. And I, I, I brought this up to you earlier today. 
Um, and that, that fits the timeline that you and I were talking about earlier. Yep. So if, if that is indeed the case, now I don't want to be some kind of insider, you know, everybody just stay off my back with this, but I knew this information. And my point now is the same point that I brought up to you earlier today. Once you file that complaint, you can go to a Star Trek convention or you can go out in the middle of the street and start yelling about this story. I don't think you have to wait for Dopser. You have to wait for Dopser to see if you're going to stay out of jail. Right? I, <laughs> but but if him going to um, Corbell or anybody else and Corbell not reacting to it. Um, Corbell had the scoop of the century in front of the New York Times and so did George Knapp. Um, uh, and ahead of the debrief, why would they choose to pass on it? It's not Dobser that is going to stop that. I, th there's no way. Dobser wouldn't stop the New York Times. You would run with the story. If you're going to vet it three times, well, you're going to well, run with that. Technically, the New York Times shouldn't know about the story until Dobser signed off. I'm, I'm not saying but that. You understand, Russia... But you understand my point here. You know, once that IG. Why are we waiting, my point, John, until June 5th of 2023 to get this story if the IG complaint was filed over a year ago? Because, okay, there's a couple ways to, to look at this. Part of what you're saying I'm going to respectfully disagree with. Mm -hmm. We know that there's an unclassified complaint that the journalists have seen. Now, they call it unclassified. Was that reviewed? I do not believe so because I haven't seen any reference to the fact that it was. But I believe that Grush believed that everything that he put on there was unclassified. Now, keep in mind, his complaint was less about alien, you know, uh, non-human craft, if you will, and more so about the reprisals that he was that he was kind of getting and, and the stuff that he turned over in July of 2021 from there on out those kind of repercussions of his actions. So that's more of what that complaint was about. So it's quite possible that he was uh, truly unclassified, that he was just kind of making a claim. Could he go out and talk about stuff that included non-human craft, bodies, wreckage, intact craft, and possession of the documents? Could he? Absolutely. Is it a huge risk? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. He's a clearance holder. Mm -hmm. And at that point, even at the Star Trek convention in August, the Department of Defense never cleared him to go out and, again, if the rumors are true and to be believed, you can't go out and summarize heavily classified programs because, according to him, all of this is heavily classified and there's a lot of material. You can't do that. And that is a big part of this story that I think many people ignore. You cannot take a special access program or an un unacknowledged special access program or anything of high classification, summarize it, go out and talk about it, and make it okay, right? You can't do that. Just because you're not giving a program name or showing a document, all of that information is still inherently classified due to the sensitive nature of what you're talking about. I always use the stealth aircraft analogy. Go back in time to when the F-117 was not made available to the public. Right. You cannot from Lockheed Martin go, OK, I'm going to go talk to the media, tell them about a fighter, not name it, but say it can evade radar. It's made with special material. It's uh, completely on the black budget. This, that and the other thing. No, you can't do that. Those are all classified programs. So just because you summarize it doesn't mean you can start going out and blabbing about it. So when he's going out and it sounds like I'm eager to hear Knapp and Corbell's story. So I'm not going to jump to any conclusions there, but obviously people are posting online that they got to meet the whistleblower through George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell at this convention. And Jeremy Corbell retweeted that and said, yes, George Knapp and I were going to come out with a story. We're essentially going to let this play out a little bit. I'm eager to hear that because Jeremy's all over the news as well, kind of throwing his support to the whistleblower. So clearly he knew the story. I mean, I, I don't I'm I'm, ex I'm not expecting a wow, we met this guy and had coffee, but had no idea who he was. I don't buy that at all. So obviously the whistleblower was out shopping the story, uh, trying to get media coverage from those names that we see a lot 
in the mainstream media. And that to me is problematic. I don't think that you see that a lot with whistleblowers in other in other topics, you know, when, I mean, when did, um, very when, unorthodox. When did David's uh, employment with the U.S. government officially end? Uh, it was, uh, I think, April of this year. April of this year. Yeah. And I want to make sure I have that right because it's not written down. Now, was he a contractor or was he a, a government employee? Um, well, that's kind of like the, the, the section that I'm not sure. I can tell you that he was the representative to the UAP task force from 2019 to 2021 for the National Reconnaissance Office. Then from late 2021 to July of 2022, he was what was called the co-lead for UAP analysis for the NGA. So with all of that said, that puts him around when the IG considered his complaint credible and essentially urgent. That was um, uh, two months after he filed it with them. And that's when his tenure there ended from July of 2022 uh, to, uh, uh, again, uh, 2023 was when he left government. Uh, I don't know if that is known. I don't recall that from the article. No, what what month of uh, 2023 did he leave? Yeah, that's what I'm government? trying to see in the article. I know it's in okay. there. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Um, and so he would have been, uh, again, looking at this, and we need uh, April all. 7th. April 7th, 2023. Yeah, and let me read it to make sure that I, I have this right. Grush left the government, left the government on April 7th, 2023 in order, he said, to advance, to advance government accountability through public awareness. He remains well supported within intelligence circles and numerous sources that vouch for his credibility. That means that it was the day after the second clearance from Dobser. Right. Okay. So that puts him at the Star Trek convention as a government employee for the NGO. Well, in, in August of 2022, yeah, that was a month after he stopped, uh, for, according to the article anyway. Right. That was a month after he stopped being the co-lead for UAP analysis at the NGA. But was he still I in the NGA? Was the UAP task force disbanded uh, at that point, and then there was no need, and Arrow was taking over, creating their own, you know, working network? That's that's a possibility. So maybe he did something else for NGA. That's kind of a stopgap in his in his timeline when it comes to his employment. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if that's somewhere, please, guys, you know, don't don't well, crucify me. I, I just let no. me know, and I'm happy to update the timeline. I'm just trying to get into uh, David's head. Maybe he was technically unemployed for four weeks and and he could have uh, shopped a book deal. <laughs> I'm just, uh, is that possible? Uh, I mean, you're going there. I'm not going to go there yet. Um, but, but, but what I will say is, according to the article, should it be believed, uh, you're looking at an April 7th, 2023 uh exit from the u.s government so so if 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 all that is true we don't know what he was doing for the nga isn't but he was you know obviously a intelligence officer so i'm sure that they had some other thing for him to do and it might not be relevant to this particular story but that is kind of a gap in, in exactly. the timeline exactly. Um, exactly but for me it's it's kind of that red flag i mean i don't know when he lawyered up i don't think that that was uh, in the article, I'll kind of quickly look uh, at it to, out of the side of my eye here. But uh, when he essentially, you know, lawyered up, but but obviously the complaint where he had the attorney uh, that was likely May 2022 or before, because we were told in the article, the attorney wrote that on his behalf. And there are graphics that although the documents have not been uh, seen or released, there is a flash of it on News Nation on one of their clips where they took, and it's undated, uh, so it, we have to go by the article. I wish there was a date on it. But they fan the what they call the disclosure of urgent concerns, complaint of reprisal. So that is what he submitted to the Intelligence Community's Inspector General Office, or what we call the ICIG. 
And so you see a fan of the documents. You can see the first page. Can't dedu deduce the date. Um, and really kind of can't. I mean, you can read it. But, it, you know, it's, it, it's nothing like really a revealing of the story. I'd like to read the whole thing. I mean, obviously, they're giving this document to a news channel to create a graphic. So I, I don't think we're dealing with classified information here. So why not release it again with personally identifying information redacted? Of course, please. You know that, that I'm a full advocate for that. So safeguard people that are mentioned or anything like that. But release it. Let, let's let's see it. Let, I mean, if you're going to blow this story wide open, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a major piece of the puzzle that the general public uh, should at least see. Uh, but more so than that, the Dopser paperwork that cleared him but didn't clear him until April. So now we're putting on the timeline that he was out at a convention. Uh, uh, people are alluding to him shopping the story around or talking about it, and that was a big no-no. What if Dopser came back and said, oh, no, we're sorry, you're encroaching on classified territory, uh, territory and denied the request? What would happen then? You well, know, I mean, so yeah. now he's out at conventions talking about it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. bad. And, and on News Nation and and Ross mm -hmm. and and everything else, but but they can't. They can't. They cannot say you cannot be talking about alien bodies. You cannot be talking about uh, uh, flying saucers because then everything is legit and he's he, he's he's elevated to martyr status I, I just don't think they can go there john stay right there got to take a quick break this is fade to black i'm your host jimmy church stay with us this is jimmy church of fade to black please visit all of our sponsors we're taking a quick break here all of the links are below and we'll be right back Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023 as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors, this is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, in indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. Also introducing our Disclosure Fest VR Starship Area with dozens of rides. You've got to check it out. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit Disclosure fest.org the secret is out life waves x39 is the reason why i have got my vision back this is jimmy church of fade to black and you need to go straight to healingworksnow.com that's healingworksnow.com works with an x all of the information that you need is on that portal. Find out why I look great. I feel great. I'm thinking clearly. I sleep. I dream. Life is good. All of it. You've got to check out Life Waves X39 and all of their other products. It's all simple to do. Go to healingworksnow.com. That's healingworksnow.com. Works with an X. Hey everybody, it's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access 
to a VIP mixture with celebrity guests, shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's gonna be a night to remember. You don't wanna forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I wanna see you there for Bid and Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, John Greenwald is with us. We're talking about David Grush, the whistleblower that Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal revealed to the world uh, earlier this week, Monday, June 5th, on The Debrief. And the article is pretty explosive. Uh, it, it's It's very specific. Now, I want to uh, reiterate, and it's it's what we call here in radio uh, a recap. Uh, back in December of 2017, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal uh, wrote that was uh, that was a that was a front page article for the New York Times, revealing for the first time that the Pentagon had a secret UFO program. Um, now, what evolved from that, it, it's been a crazy five and a half years for sure. Now, this week, once again, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal have written an article um, that centers around a whistleblower. His name is David Grush. And uh, David is uh, claiming, allegedly, that the United States government has uh, intact Flying saucers. I'm saying flying saucers. You can say craft from another world. Whatever. Flying saucers, ET craft, aliens, ET craft, and pilots uh, of those craft and alien bodies. Now, here's uh, my point that I want to make with this, John. Um, David, because of his uh, CV, because of his resume, um, seems credible to me. He does. He seems credible. This is a crazy story. But there's a point here that I think needs to be made. No matter what we deduce from Leslie and Ralph's original article back in December of 2017, everything that transpired after that, TTSA, Tom DeLong, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, Hal Putoff, the length, the list, of the thing, the A-tip, A-tip, WASAT, the, the, crazy, right? Five and a half years. But what it did do is it elevated the presence of this to the world and 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 as 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 good or bad as any of the individuals or the reasons are it elevated things into the media like never before it's the same thing with this article now we have two questions two two Forget about everything else with, with David Grush or anybody else. Jonathan Gray is a pseudonym. <laughs> to the timing, Star Trek inventions, all of that. You know what? Where are the flying saucers? Where are the alien bodies? And Congress is now asking those questions. And now we're going to have more hearings. And now I think the White House has got some questions to answer to as well. Where are the flying saucers and where are the alien bodies? That's what comes from this article. We can pick it apart, and I've been picking it apart, but there's really just two things here suddenly in the public eye that were never there before. Do you agree? Yeah, and I think it's it. I think it's really good. I, I mean, I see through the, your chat room during the break, I was kind of looking through some of that, and I, I mean, I see some of the hate on what what we're talking about, mainly what I'm I'm bringing up. Um, so let me say two things if I can. I mean, yeah, to, to, to your point, things are are still unfolding. I mean, Congress is going to be 
looking at this, doing a hearing, all of that is great. I want to see what happens and I want to see how that unfolds. But we, I think we have to prepare ourselves. What if they come back and say that there's nothing to it? The general public will not believe that. I, I mean, I, I, I guarantee it. The, the hatred that I'm getting from from people bringing up some of these points I think that crowd is not going to really believe it, but I'm eager to see how that plays out. But the reason why I was kind of hitting some of the points before the break, and we didn't really talk about this specifically. So if I can just make this one point, because I think it kind of brings it all together. Mm -hmm. I can prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the UAP topic, the secrecy surrounding it is, is being clamped down from a legal standpoint, from the spokespeople, the DOD, they are completely pushing themselves away from revealing anything with the exception of the select few hearings that we've gotten and a select few visuals. Um, I'm not sure. I just wrote this story actually in the last few days. I don't know uh, if you saw it, but I'm, I'm happy to chat about that as well to kind of support that. But the bottom line is the secrecy is clamping down. So with that mindset, David Grush takes his statements that we all are hearing about and we all want them to be true to the arm of the Department of Defense that really is authorized at a top secret level to look at everything. Some people argue Arrow is not, and, and I can actually get on board with that. I know that they're not fully cleared on every aspect of all this, but what I think uh, is, is Dopser. And so they see the statements that Grush wants to convey to the media, and they do have that access or the ability to contact the agencies uh, treading both into Title 10 and Title 50 territory to really evaluate what Grush is going to take to the media. They do not endorse. They do not fact check. They ensure no classified information is in this. So with that, they gave their stamp of approval. What can we deduce from that? The biggest problem of the story in my book. And that is the fact that if there was anything that was related to this that was true, I'm not saying that it's not, but I'm just saying in the eyes of Dopser, it would be heavily classified. We all know that. And there's no possible way he can summarize it and get away with it. Yet Dopser put their approval on it anyway, which means the realization of non-human craft is an unclassified topic to the U.S. government. If true, that's what we're saying. The realization of bodies, non-human dead pilots of these non-human craft as described with Grush, we are now accepting that that, if true, is an unclassified aspect to the United States government. And the fact that we have non-human craft in our holding, both intact craft and debris and material, all non-human made, but technology nonetheless. That, if true, is considered unclassified to the U.S. government. There's a huge problem with that. That's not reality. That is not the world we're living in. Quite the opposite. Anything related to UAP is is heavily classified, so it would never pass the Dopser test. That's my biggest problem. Okay, and, let me, and I don't think a lot of people are looking at that. Okay, let me ask you about Dopser for a second. Um, in this highly compartmentalized world, and certainly if we're talking about ET and alien bodies. Nobody knows nothing, right? Everything is just so segmented and, and, and separated. Is it possible that uh, those that are involved with DOPS or clearance don't know anything about alien craft or alien bodies and would have looked over and just thought, what? No, he can talk about that. that that's not real. Is that a possibility? Looking, looking at not only the Dopser process, obviously through Luis Elizondo's uh, effort to get the three original UAP videos uh, cleared. That's a whole different story. He didn't get them cleared for public release. Uh, he didn't want to, according to him. He wanted them for internal use, but he had to go through the Dopser process. So by me digging in on that and digging up numerous other cases... Uh, of non-UFO related, but sometimes classified or controlled unclassified information, uh, stuff that had to go through the process. That's not how they work. They don't look at it and go, oh, I'm sure it's not classified, you know, or I don't know anything about this. So yeah, 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 let it go. No, on the contrary, they do look into it. Now, but I have- we're talking, But we're talking about flying saucers and alien bodies. Okay, we're not, there's we're, an we're assumption not, there. 
But it, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. Yeah, no, we need but, to know what, what did David Grush pitch to Dop, Dopser? That, and, and that's a bigger point. Did he say, we're led to believe in the article, so show us the paperwork. And, and that's, this is why I think a lot of people are missing that, that they're harping me on it. But what is it that he submitted to Dopser? We assume that it's bodies and craft. That's what we were told. Well, that's what he says. He says he well, gave. I'm not sold on that at this point. I understand that. But he says he's on the record saying that he gave the IG all of the supporting documents for this. Well, that's yeah. the IG, not Dobser. Uh, no, but but the IG complaint goes to Dobser. They're mm, definitely, no. uh, they would have to look to, to make sure that the, the, what what is it that he's complaining about and what he may say publicly? I would that, that was so the complaint is different than what he submitted to Dopser to clear for release. So whistleblowers and and this gets into a, a crazy gray area. I've I've got a request into uh, someone who I've known for many many years, not part of the UFO field, but is a very well known attorney dealing with whistleblower complaints and stuff like that. Uh, right. We've known each other through FOIA channels and stuff like that and 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 communicate, uh, you know, s semi often. And so I, I reached out to them to see if uh, they would add their two cents on on how that this is playing out. But as as far as I understand of the process, uh, because, again, I, I'm no attorney, so I, I'm, I'm not an attorney, uh, but I've been around the block enough to know in situations like these by investigating numerous whistleblower complaints, not only in the UFO realm, but actually primarily outside of the UFO realm, uh, you have a very tight seal over all of those whistleblower complaints when it comes to the U.S. government. What the whistleblower themselves wants to say to the public that then needs to be cleared so he cannot just turn around and start blasting the classified aspects of all of this to the general public however if what is truly labeled unclassified and we were told there was an unclassified uh complaint then there should be no reason for him to release that but that therein is kind of a, a, a gray area where then, yes, Dopser may need to get involved. But at that point, you're talking about inspector general territory, and that might be a different ballgame. That's the aspect of the legal side that I'm not 100 percent on. Right, right, right. But right. regardless, though, we know that that the complaint is not what was approved by Dopser. The the submitted statements were. And, and that's what I'm eager to see. That's what I'm eager to see. What did you get clearance on? We're led to believe it's, again, the non-human craft and all that. Because if he's saying it, according to him in the article, he should be cleared to, to say it. And that's fine. So let's see it. Let's see what you submitted to Dobster. And if all of that is in there, bodies, non-human craft, uh, we'll, we'll see what else there might be. And Dobster gives their stamp of approval. We need to ask the question, how could it pass the test? Dobser is not careless, and, and anybody can research this. You don't have to take my word for it, but they are the arm of the Department of Defense that ensures that if anybody is writing a manuscript or putting anything public, that they look at it and approve it for release. That's their job, cleared at a top secret level. So it, it doesn't make sense that if the reviewer thought, oh, no, there's nothing classified with this that they would – you know, just sign off on it. On the contrary, they would go to what are called the OCAs or the original classifying authorities mm -hmm. to every agency that Grush was talking about. Um, again, if if he if he put that into his um, statement, you know, and so again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be vague there, but we don't know what Grush submitted to Dobser. But that process, they look at that and wherever they can tie in a, a potential OCA, uh, they go to them and then essentially uh, go over and review that material to juxtapose that with Elizondo's form, even though he did not want it for public release. Uh, he they did have to go to the OCA, which in this case was the Navy for those videos. And it's listed right on the form. It says OCA and then it's a redacted name. Right. Then they Dopser then goes to them and says, hey, Luis Elizondo wants to share these with cleared partners. 
can we do that? Not the public, but he was looking to, and it, th this is what he told me directly. It's in a recorded interview. Everybody thinks he wanted them for the public. That's not what he said. He wanted th to use them internally in a database. Regardless of that not being released to the public, they still had to clear it with the OCA. So it gets into some really snoozy jargon. I get all that. But regardless, it's incredibly important because that review process I'm sorry, if any of this was true, he cannot summarize a SAP or anything of that classification level to the general public and have the DOD sign off on it. Not with their views on UAP material at this point. It just wouldn't happen. And that, to me, is the biggest red flag. That does not mean that David Grush is a big old liar. I mean, he's trying to mislead all of us. Nor does it mean that his story is untrue. But it is a huge red flag that at this point I haven't seen anybody of note address. Is he protected under the whistleblower uh, uh, aspect of this that... Uh, you know, it, it's not that he is revealing. I've, I've, I've had so many Dobbs or experts contact me, right? Everybody's got a, 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 a take on this, on, 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 on how Dobbs or handles this. But putting all of that aside, um, it, it, does David maybe just not give a crap? And he is protected uh, under the whistleblower side of this. And his lawyer has said, look, I mean, what if it comes out? Dobster says you cannot. He is uh, obviously, uh, John, this is where for me, I have a big problem. His story is flying saucers and alien bodies, right? That we are. That's the story. What is it that he's going to tell Dobster? that he is going to talk about. He's not writing a book. He's not appearing in a movie. Um, this that isn't, you know of. Well, that's a great point, isn't it? Um, uh, that's I don't why know. they don't want to show the paperwork. Maybe, maybe he is represented by an agent. I, I don't know. Uh, but all of that being said, if, if it comes out in, in the Dopser that that is exactly what he wrote down because that's his story, right? Th th maybe he just doesn't care. Maybe his lawyer has said, don't worry about it. Dopser says this. You can't talk about it, but this is your story. You're protected under the whistleblower side of this. This is part of the UAP thing. We want people like you to come forward tell your story and maybe that's where we're at with this well it, it's quite possible when it comes to the protection itself that's why i've reached out to uh, again um someone that i've known who's much much smarter than me who uh, is an attorney and and their knowledge will absolutely be critical and kind of unfolding that aspect to it but we do know from senator gillibrand herself who had stated that if there are, you know, there, there are some levels of protection at this point. So if Grush feels that he's being, you know, stonewalled or whatever, I hope that he marches into Senator Gillibrand's office because she put out there the offer. And, and I would encourage him to do that. I would also encourage the people that Grush has talked to to come out. That's what we really need. Um, he does not to necessarily reveal themselves to all of us and put themselves you know, to, at the the vicious end of of, of UFO Twitter, um, that's not what I mean. But but rather put themselves out there to where if if Grush's complaint is dismissed and nobody's taking his claim seriously, then I hope they all march into Gillibrand's office arm and arm and say, "Look, we're the ones that talked to Grush, and here's where the bodies are buried, both literally and figuratively." and put that information out there um, because I think that that's what we need at this point. And for me, the bottom line is, and I'm sure I'll get hate mail for this, but I do not believe with a story of this magnitude that if the government pushes back and essentially says, no, we find no validity in these claims, then the people that Grush is talking to, if they have any evidence whatsoever, come forward mm -hmm. because there's no way in my mind that if the government pushes back and says there's no validity to these claims, well, then what are they going to do? There's no classified information being spilled, right? They says nothing is valid. So if these people really have something to share, then come forward at that point. Tell the world and change humanity. 
because I think that uh, that if the government is truly going to do that and there is absolute truth to this, then come forward. You're not going to be seeing handcuffs after somebody does that. I, I don't I don't buy it. If the government says there's no validity to the story, they shut it down and they don't take anything seriously, then there's no way they put somebody in cuffs if they come out and say this is where the body is. These are the craft. This is the isotopic analysis that we ran because none of that exists, according to the government. So bring it all out. Change humanity. Show it to the physicists, the, the scientists of the world. Bring it all out because the government denied that any of it existed. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think it would go beyond that. Uh, I, I, I was joking about this earlier today, John, uh, and I don't mean to be so cavalier. Um, uh, atomic analysis of these uh, materials don't mean crap. Open up the hangar doors, let the press in, show them the flying saucer. That, you know, it's, it, what it's made of, I don't care if it's made of plastic. I, it, 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 what, you know, what if it's made of Russian titanium? But it's the same titanium that is in zeta reticuli. But here's here now. Let me get to my point. Um, through all of this, and it kind of supports what you just said. Through all of this, we we've, we've got the announcement from the House Oversight Committee came out today, and they said that they are now preparing a hearing on UFOs uh, because of David Grush. Mm-hmm. Now, is he telling the truth? Dops or be damned or, or anything else? That is the result of that. The Oversight Committee chairman, James Comer, right, Republican out of Kentucky, um, was asked about this on News Nation. None of this would have happened if it wasn't for Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal in the debrief on, on Monday on the 5th. Um, last night, Oversight Committee spokesman Austin Hacker said, and I'm quoting here, in addition to recent claims by a whistleblower, David Grush, reports continue to surface regarding unidentified anomalous phenomena. The House Oversight Committee is following these UAP reports and is in the early stages of planning another hearing. Republican Representatives Anna Polina, uh, Luna and, of course, Tim Burchett, confirmed today on Twitter that they will lead the committee's investigation into UFOs, officially referred to as unidentified anomalous phenomena on UAPs. So that the this is the results of this. Dobser th- telling the truth, lying. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have no idea. But the, the, this is the results of this, just like what happened back in December of 2017. Yeah, the hearing is an exciting development. I was intrigued by that. I can't wait. But we haven't heard it's open yet, meaning it's it, will it be for the public or will it be behind closed doors because of Grush's security clearance and the fact that he may you know, uh, have to encroach on classified territory, even when he's not talking about alien bodies, but in some other answers for foundation or something like that. So they may do this hearing behind closed doors. Uh, At this point, as you and I talk, I have not seen that they were doing a open hearing confirmed, but rather a hearing. So I think that that it'll be interesting to see if they actually will do this in the open. Uh, We'll We'll see. I mean, uh, again, the, the, the jury's out there, but it's a it's a positive development no matter what. But we then have to kind of as as we anticipate that and wait for it. What happens if if the if the Congress looks at it, they do their hearing behind closed doors or not? What happens if the world doesn't change? What happens if they don't come out of that going, oh, my gosh, well, like all the, all of this is is legitimate. Um, because you have so many factors involved here on whether or not that they would be actually honest with the general public if it were true. And, and it, that's, again, goes back to the root of this that bothers me so much because I just don't think that he would be able to get to that point. I think you're going to see a conveyance of what, he've, what he's heard and then potentially no real action after that the government will chime in and unless i'm pleasantly surprised and they go okay we've been lying to you guys yeah there's bodies and craft 
uh, which I don't anticipate happening, how will that play out? And and I think that we can't isn't get that too the, overly I mean, excited about this. But isn't that the strange part? You brought this up yourself at the beginning of the show. We've got disinformation and misinformation supporting both sides of the argument. Yeah. <laughs> Right. It doesn't make any sense. And and maybe is it is it that the government is at the point of tapping out? OK, uh, you know what? This is where we are. Now we've got somebody from the government t- talking the smack. This we have to take serious and maybe the cat is out of the bag. That's a possibility. And then, and it's, you must have so much FOIA fodder right now. I can't imagine uh, what you're working on right now. But apparently, he's given us some dates and locations. Uh, this 1933 crash retrieval in Italy. Yeah. Uh, for you, you don't need much for FOIA. John Greenwald needs a period and a comma, and that's all you need, and you can go and get all the FOIA. I've worked, I've worked with less, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, what do we do with this? We got a 1933 crash retreat. He's given a description of it. Um, uh, is, is that something that is, man, I'm going to use the word, chastise me later foyable <laughs> is it, uh, is it not fo- really but this, this is a story that's been around in books before i had i actually tweeted this out so if anybody uses twitter black vault com like dot com but without the period black vault com is my my handle uh it's uh, as we speak right now live it is one of the t- one of the top posts most recent i should say so you should see it in the top and with permission a couple years back um, the publishing company wanted me to, to 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 publish this document. There's documents on there. It's a full article. It goes into the details of this case. Um, I could not recite them to you because I'm not really well versed on what this case is. But when I heard about Grush bringing up this case, I tweeted out that page just for some extra context for everybody out there. Uh, some people are saying that this is going to work against him. Others are very intrigued by it. Again, you have the warring factions on whether or not this is actually going to hurt or harm his story. Um, I am neutral on that at this point. I just, you know, I, I, I like when I can to just say, here's the information. You guys do it and read it and decide for yourself, because that has been a case that has been written about in books and and so on and has been around for many years so that article will have quite a bit for you uh but that's not my question mm-hmm. okay but, th- but thank you for all of that john that was i'm sorry if i missed something that was missed? that was precise and to the point um is there enough with this case uh to get more information out of it for congress um, for the intelligence committees, uh, it, 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 it's before everybody's time. Anybody that was involved with that is dead, right? It's 100 years ago. So is there enough there for, I mean, why bring it up if there's, is or was he shown something? Again, he keeps referencing uh, the materials that he was shown that he forwarded on to the IG. Is this one of those cases? Is there enough there for the government to 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 look into? Yeah, from 1933 to FOIA material, you can absolutely FOIA material that old. Uh, I mean, I foiled FOIA documents from World War One. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely FOIA a bull. Uh, But the intelligence agencies that would likely have anything on it didn't exist uh, really at that point. I mean, you know, you you had a lot of agencies more in the 1947 era come around uh, versus anything that that uh, would have information on this. Most of this is from Italian archives. So in essence, you would have to go through the Italian government if they had anything. So so, yeah, I mean, I wasn't dodging that that part of your question, but there's really nothing that you can really FOIA on our side unless During the course of this, this now has become an interest of the U.S. government. And then one of the intelligence agencies starts to say, well, hey, wait a minute. We've seen credible evidence of a 1933 XYZ. Uh, What can we find out? And then that becomes foyable. But until we get word of, you know, if that's even going to happen, I I, I don't know. 
um, bottom line, though, this case is not new. It's it's been around for, it's for many, been around many years. for a while. And I certainly uh, do, I, 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 I wouldn't I wouldn't think that uh, uh, I'm going to upset half of my audience that somebody I do that often. <laughs> somebody, You're fine. Yeah, yeah, you do it. You do it all on your own um, <laughs> uh, that somebody gave him, you know, some dog eared copy of the Philadelphia experiment and gave him a book and said, this is this is this really happened. I don't think that's the case with David. I, something else was given to him. Which is uh, bringing me to this next point. Maybe this, they're calling it the bell, right? Again, right? Here we go. Die, die clock or however you say it. Um, is that object sitting in a laboratory somewhere in a warehouse out here in the Mojave Desert? That's the point. Um, it hasn't been sat and researched on, and would that be foyable? Not the crash retrieval from 1933. I could give a crap about that. Where is the, where is that object today, and have we been backwards engineering that, and is that foyable? Yeah, it, in essence, it all would be. Everything that David Grush has talked about, in summation anyway, would be foyable if we had actual details to work with. But again, we don't have those details, so we just have stories at, at this point. And, and this is, again, that concern to where, you know, even though we don't have those details, even summation, it would be classified. So that's a big hurdle, I think, that those involved in this story, when they appear before Congress, will have to get over. Hopefully they have those details. It's rumored they do. So great. If they do, then Congress will hopefully go right to the door of wherever they said and and figure this out. But then the question mark, whether or not Grush's story is real or not, will Congress be open and honest with the general public? And I have my doubts about that. So take my skepticism about Grush's claims, put it out the window. Mm -hmm. Let's say for a moment they're all true. If Congress finds that out, will they tell us? Or will the intelligence community that's in, been in charge of keeping this all secret convince the senators and congressmen hey look you know we'll give you a bone or maybe something that we can talk about but you cannot reveal any of this um so we have to you know figure figure out more of a cover story so that way you can appease your constituents you looked into it you found that yes it does involve some type of technology but we're safe and everybody's all hunky-dory uh and and cover it up again for another hundred years until somebody else comes along so there's a lot of things at play here because I go back to the provable secrecy that is deepening when it comes to this topic. And it's only gotten worse. And in the last week, didn't get a lot of press, especially because of what's going on this week. And it's snoozy. I get it. Some of these legal things are, are awful. But the Department of Defense has now done, in my view, a brand new effort to legally thwart any effort through the Freedom of Information Act to get UAP related information that they have created now an argument that is going to be incredibly difficult for me to fight. I have fought through the last quite a few years through the appeal process and won quite a few of those appeals, lost quite a few also, uh, but won them to go back and release information that they first denied. But though now their tactic is making what Arrow's mission is labeling it a law enforcement investigation. And by doing so, exemption B7 now comes into play where if they label everything Arrow is doing as B7, that means that any UAP related anything as it relates to Arrow will be 100% exempt through the Freedom of Information Act from top to bottom, left to right, 100% in perpetuity until Arrow ceases to exist. Mm-hmm. That is incredibly problematic, and that does not help stories like David Grush, no, that's who F says, that's oh, F yeah, F no, I can talk about bodies and craft. Right. Right. No right. way. There's right. no right. way those things are, are, are together in this conversation. Not at all. Okay, Let, let's wrap this up with probably the most important part of this entire uh, story. 
because we are dealing with special access programs, black, dark, disappearing money, and and entities that exist outside of the government, is it possible for the oversight committee, right? Is it possible for James Comer? Is it possible for Marco Rubio or the Senate Intelligence Committee to go and look into special access programs to confirm David Grush's statements? Is it outside of even their purview and their enforcement in, uh, abilities? Uh, it's I've seen it argued both ways. They should be able to have oversight even on some of these deep, dark secrets that the U.S. government and U.S. military holds. Uh, but I've also seen arguments that they would be denied as well. But it's a very difficult path to walk down because now you're just getting into a conspiracy mindset that you can't believe anybody. And 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 that's fine. Maybe we can't believe anybody, um, but that's uh, kind of leaning into my my thing earlier in your show that I brought up that it's quite possible David Grush is being misled to create a very muddy pit of information that's now been put forth to the general public to confuse the heck out of everyone. And uh, at the end of the day, bring no evidence along with it. But to your point, would they have access? We we would hope. But. If Grush is telling the truth and his sources are solid and all the stories are true, that means that the information that Grush has will be able to take Marco Rubio or whomever on a journey uh, to the front door of wherever this stuff is, despite security layers, and, and, and find this out and really knock on the doors. So if the senators, if the congressmen, women, uh, whomever wants answers, it sounds like Grush can give that to them. And I'm eager to see, despite my skepticism, hey, if he's telling the truth, then the blueprint is there. The, the roadmap, I should say, is there to take Congress directly to the door of where these secrets are being kept and let's change the world and, and see what happens. You know, and, and that's the bottom line here. But will that actually take place? I don't I don't know. Um, that's why it's an exciting time we live in because we're all on this journey together, you know, and we're 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 heading towards the season finale on the uh, on on the U ufology grush season when this hearing happens, and we'll see what happens after. Yeah, I was pretty depressed at the end of Succession. By the way, I, I don't know if I <laughs> I don't know if I want to see the end of this. Uh, I, 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 the journey is is. Uh, as much fun as getting to the real information. But um, the, the question is, why would Grush make it up? Not that he was misled. Okay, let's, get, let's go to the other extreme. Why, uh, in a volunteer sense, walk the plank? Ruin your life and ruin your name and reputation. Why would you do that? I, 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 I don't feel it, John. I, I, I don't I just, think you would. I, 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 that was not my first thought on that. Yeah. I mean, it's possible, you know, but I, with, with what he's done, which works to his credit, filing the complaint and so on and so forth, um, I just don't, I, I don't see a 100% fabricated story that he's making it I up. Don't I, that that I, I I, I, I was not on that originally and, and not on that now. Um, but one thing, and I've seen it in your chat as well, that if he is not telling the truth in the complaint that he would go to jail, um, that is also a big misconception about all of this. Is that, I, now, I've heard this repeated over and over yeah. and over again, right? Uh, that I, I have signed documents uh, as uh, a military dependent, right? And, and you see that at the bottom, right? Five years imprisonment, $10,000 fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, 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 that seems to be everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but now uh, it is certainly part of the conversation that this, uh, this involves prison time and, and a heavy fine and, and everything else. You're saying that that may not be the case? No, because if he's conveying what he believes to be the truth and it goes into the scenario of is he misled or, or anything to that effect, 
um, he's still conveying what he believes to be true. So they're not going to slap him in cuffs and go, that's it, man, you're going to jail. Where those lines are in those documents that you've signed, but more so in the security arena, when you're making legal accusations and criminal accusations against someone and you have created a plot against them, generally that's what those lines are there for, that you are creating a, a fictionalized scenario to try and get somebody else in trouble that's generally what you're going to get prosecuted for, you know, and and if he did make up this entire story, um, would that even constitute jail time? I, I don't I, I don't see that. But I mean, maybe I just don't think he is making it up. I, I do think that he's basing it on something. And, and um, I, you know, I, I, I don't see that it would play out that way. But the misconception of of him lying or having factually incorrect information in his complaint, even though he swore under, you know, penalty of perjury that it was true. But if it was wrong, it all depends on the context. And I'll give you a real world provable example. And ironically, it's about Luis Elizondo's inspector general complaint. Mm-hmm. And there is an entire section in there that is wrong. Not because I say it's wrong, but because I know it's wrong. Uh, It is factually incorrect, and it places an accusation on somebody that had nothing to do with the situation at hand. How do I know? Because I'm the one that did the actual story. I'm the one that worked with the Department of Defense through not only the Freedom of Information Act, uh, but another process to get um, essentially what led to the discovery that Luis Elizondo's emails were all destroyed. Susan Goff had nothing to do with this. The Pentagon spokesperson had zero to do with this. I was working with a legal division within the Department of Defense to get statements, and I worked on this story for months. I was making sure that I dotted every I and crossed every T. I was very intimately involved in that. Yet in the complaint, that story was used Susan Goff was blamed, and she's the one that actually had the accusation made against her in the inspector general complaint, and the story was exaggerated. I asked for clarification from him. He never gave it to me that if he had some other information that he never informed me of, could he please prove it? He never did. He then turned the emails being destroyed as his entire file base and data and this and that um, that was all untrue. I have not seen any evidence to support that. And so I bring that up to say he's not let out in cuffs. His inspector general complaint was dismissed. It was found to not be um, actionable, that, that, that there, was no, there was no action for them to take, and they closed it. We don't hear about that a lot. We just hear about the complaint. But it was closed uh, the beginning of 2022, or, or I think March or something like that. And uh, I got the letter actually released through the Freedom of Information. I got all that information. But my whole point being is that he wasn't arrested, and yet there was a provably incorrect portion of his inspector general complaint. And, again, I've got numerous documents to back up all of that. Um, and I'm happy to release all of them if I ever had to. Um, but all of that information is already in the, the, the public domain. The communications are all in the public domain. The signed letters from the Department of Defense are already in the public domain. I've published them all. Uh, so that's easily proven. So an accusation was made against somebody that wasn't true. But in fairness to Luis Elizondo, maybe he thought it was. And, and that, that then goes to, well, are they going to prosecute him for that? Well, this is a provable example. No, that's not the case. So the jail argument has to go away because we can cite provable examples that that is not the case when you have factually incorrect information in a complaint. Uh, whistleblower protection, does it cover... Because uh, David Grush has has stated um, that he provided the documents to the IG's office to to back this up. What what is in those documents? I don't know. You know, I have no idea. I don't know what was provided to Dobser. I, I I don't. But he's insinuating flying saucers and alien bodies. Right. That's that's the assumption that we're making here. If those documents um, support that, then I would have to assume and conclude that they are highly classified. 
him being in possession of those documents and providing those to the IG, is he protected? Can he possess those documents? One, he got them through the UAP task force or, or whatever. Is he protected under uh, whistleblower protection uh, for possessing those for the brief moment that he hands them over to the IG? They're certainly not unclassified documents. Right. If they're about alien bodies and flying saucers. So is he protected uh, if he was in possession of, you know, the hottest paper in the world? Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to get clarification on on a couple fronts from people much smarter than me when it comes to legal. So I don't have any answer for you on that. I do know there is some level of whistleblower protection. But again, if if he's talking about special compartmentalized information, again, top secret SCI that he's not cleared to hear, mm -hmm. um, there's some 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 pro potential problems there, because if it's all true and other people are reading him in on this SCI information and he's not cleared for that, well, that's that's potentially problematic. Also, also kind of an interesting red flag of the story. Because he's admitting to that, that all these people are spilling all this information and that he has X amount of hours worth of, of, of interviews and, and so on. Uh, what in that is truly classified and, and, yeah, I, I, and, and privileged? That's right. But, but what's, what's the alternative here? And you have a moral dilemma, right? You're now like a walking paradox. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. And you're sitting on this information. Do you just clam up? Yeah. Or do you do you martyr yourself? Do you go to the IG and do you go public? And do you do an interview with Ross Colfart? I, you know, I uh, I think if if all of this plays out the way that it seems like it might, then he did the right thing. Yeah, and that's the protection there. Uh, I, I, again, I'm not I'm not really privy to from the legal standpoint on where that protection is, is that uh, if he had it, didn't say anything and was caught with it, is that prosecutable? But now with the whistleblower protection, he took it, handed it off and said, hey, wait a minute, we need to do something about that. That will likely clear him. Uh, but again, potentially backing up to the the area where he got the documents from and the people and so on. Uh, are they protected because they are not the whistleblowers? They're they're not the ones right, coming right, forward. Right, they were the right. ones that took potentially top secret SCI information, passed it to somebody who wasn't cleared, and they are not coming forward with any type of you know whistleblower protection claim or anything like that. So is that why you would lawyer up though, right? Get get the yeah, hand it to your lawyer. You're not in possession of it anymore, right? And now the lawyer writes the complaint, and he's handing it over, and you are not in possession of the documents anymore, and you've gone through the legal window. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the, and those are all gr great questions that I'm seeking clarification on, because if he has this mountain of classified information, then he gets an attorney. And, and I should mention that we haven't mentioned yet the attorney is is really impressive when it comes to the background. I was really impressed by by who represented uh, re represents him. He's the first inspector general of the intelligence community. He's the first ICIG. So it's kind of interesting that he's the one that has has um, been enlisted to represent Grush. So I'm I'm really eager to see this guy interviewed. I mean, I'd love to interview him. Uh, I, I haven't talked to him, but. Uh, regardless, would love if he does it. I highly doubt he will. I mean, generally, attorneys are very, very in whistleblower situations, um, pretty guarded uh, to a point. They, they, they get information what they can out there. But while a case is still ongoing, again, this is outside of the UFO realm. But if you watch those types of things, those attorneys are somewhat guarded. They'll do some media, you know, but they're not going to be doing podcasts and stuff like that. They're going to wait for this to kind of run its course. But I'm super intrigued by the attorney and his involvement, his acceptance of this. How much does he how much does he believe of the claims or how much from an, a, a, an attorney standpoint does he feel, hey, look, the legitimacy of the claims is of no interest to me, but the representation of my client getting fair, fair treatment is, you know, and a lot of lawyers have that mindset of of it's not about 
what what their client did or didn't do, but rather getting the proper representation. Not that this is a criminal trial, but you know what I mean? It's that mindset that they are there to make sure their client is properly represented, not there to validate the claims that are within Grush's um, holdings when it comes to the interviews that he's done and so on. So it'll be interesting also to see that aspect play out. What? Okay, uh, I've got 60 seconds. I'm just, what's next, man? <laughs> this crazy, aside from 10-foot aliens running around looking for Mick West in Las Vegas, um, what's next, man? Uh, can it get any crazier? Oh, absolutely. It can get crazier, man. Don't put anything beyond, oh, 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 don't, don't, don't put anything past the UFO community to not generate something that's more interesting than this. So I'm eager to, 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 to be on this ride with you and see where it plays out. And look, I know that we've talked a lot about the skeptical red flags. I'll make it very quick. The skeptical red flags here. And I get it. I mean, I, I get a lot of heat for it. Not everybody wants to hear about that. But if Grush's claims are true, they will survive any question that I pose and yep. any skepticism that we have. And I will be right there to support the man when uh, or if any of this evidence is confirmed. Not that he cares about my support, but what I mean is, is that I will bring that to viewers of my channel just as quick as I bring questions and concerns. But I don't know why people get so upset when you question something because it will survive all of that. What's next? FOIA requests have already been filed. And even during our conversation, I wrote down one to file that I didn't think of. Um, so that's that's awesome. And just trying to, to, to figure out what every puzzle piece is and go from there question everything john greenwald you are the absolute very best my friend never change that. you're not you're not going to change but just listen no. to me don't. okay no. <laughs> stay the course i appreciate it yeah anytime thanks again for the invite it's always a pleasure you're the best john thank you so much have a thank great you. weekend john greenwald it is the black vault the black vault.com is below you can follow him on twitter black vault com right there on twitter and that's it this is the end of a crazy week what a crazy week not only uh for me personally it's been fun but uh the community and <laughs> now now we got 10 foot aliens running around vegas i want to thank john greenwald for coming in this story what is going on right now with david grush it's just the beginning, and I really, really appreciate the way that things are moving forward. Okay? House Oversight Committee, right? Senate Intelligence Committee, Timber Chet, they're, they're not playing around. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Free. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin, Webmasters Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody on Monday. Have a great, safe, fun, and amazing weekend. Go back, Lee Tappy.